Why would businesses be concerned about compassion when their sole reason for existing is to generate profits and create value for their shareholders? This was the feedback that I got from a friend of mine a couple of months ago when I asked his opinion about the role of business in peace innovation or the role of compassion in business. And he's not alone in sharing and holding this belief, but I believe that we need a fundamental shift because we need businesses to care about compassion because of things like this. This is a picture from the most recent fire from Bangladesh, where over 800 people were killed in a factory. They think the death toll may go up to actually over 1,000. And that comes less than six months after a similar fire in Bangladesh, where 117 people were killed. Everyone's familiar with this. This is the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010, which devastated the ecosystem of the Gulf Coast. We need businesses to care about compassion because of the issues facing, facing us in the 21st century. So what is compassion? We've heard a lot about it already today, but compassion is the sympathetic consciousness of others' distress, but importantly with a desire to alleviate it. And as we've already heard and we'll, we'll probably continue to hear, compassion often has a sort of selfish motivation or benefit that people get out of participating in, in acts of compassion release of oxytocin, the strengthening of social networks. Um, compassion actually can be a very selfish act. And we don't demean that experience when we see individuals doing it, so why should we expect anything less from businesses? In 1914, Henry Ford did something radical at the time. He doubled the average worker's pay from $2.50 to $5. And at the same time, he reduced the workday from nine hours to eight hours. Um, this had a very profound impact on society. In fact, a lot of people point to this as being sort of the beginning of the rise of the middle class in America. And certainly a lot of people really benefited from this act. But the motivation for Henry Ford and the Ford Company was actually that the cost of employee turnover was really impacting the business. And by changing it from a nine-hour workday to an eight-hour workday, they were able to seamlessly create the 24-7 assembly line production that we all know today. It had a positive impact for the Ford Company, sure, but people's lives were positively impacted. And I believe that we can find more examples where it's and both instead of either or. Fast forward 100 years, this is the current CEO of Ford. His name is Alan Mulally. And he has one of the best definitions of sustainability that I've ever heard. Now, sustainability is often the term in the business world that's used to describe acts of compassion. And he says that to be sustainable is to be able to continue to serve. And he goes on to say, to be able to continue to serve by creating products that people want, that they're willing to pay for, using the fewest amount of resources, with the most cost-effective production system. And I would actually go on to add, with the smallest or least amount of impact. But not all companies have visionary leaders like Ford today. So how do we create compelling business cases? How do we demonstrate the ROI, the return on investment, to get the rest of the business world on board? This is a graph from the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, which is an inter international organization where companies can articulate the impact and efforts that they're doing to reduce their CO2. And what you see on the top line there uh, is the performance, the return, the financial return from the companies that are called the Carbon Disclosure Leader Index, uh, which is a group of organizations that the CDP says is doing the best job of re reducing their CO2. And you'll see that they're actually doubling their financial performance over the rest of the pact. Now, it's not a direct correlation, but I think we're starting to see that businesses aren't going to at least pay penalties by embracing sustainability acts, and a lot of times they'll be the financial leaders. Now, there's different ways to metric all of this. CDP is one way. Certainly, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index is something that businesses are clamoring to become part of. Uh, there's the Global Reporting Initiative, which is a global framework uh, that companies can use to articulate their sustainability initiatives. But there isn't a great metric right now for tying the actual financial performance and profitability and directly linking it to the sustainability and new business models that companies are creating. 
Uh, there's two new frameworks that are being evaluated currently right now within the next couple of months. I encourage everyone to go online and provide their considered feedback. Uh, one is by SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, another one is by IRC called Integrated Reporting. Um, and you can tell by the name Integrated Reporting that they're trying to get exactly to this issue. But we need to accelerate this process. We need to be focusing on creating compelling business cases to justify uh, adopting acts of compassion. Because if we don't, then things that are associated with sustainability start to become a dirty word. And we're already seeing that in the corporate world. Sustainability teams are becoming marginalized. Um, companies know that they need to do something, but they're often in the marketing and communications team. It's often funded by the foundation. It's really not seen as something that's going to be driving growth and um, creating new areas and tapping into new markets. What companies are comfortable with is innovation, though. Um, and my definition of innovation is the ability to adapt um, to survive. If you look at companies like GE, which today I think a lot of people would consider one of the most innovative companies around, uh, you'll see that it has a profound impact. So they were one of the first 12 companies in 1896 to be listed on the Dow. And they're the only company out of those original 12 that's still listed. And you can see why. They stayed true to their core competency, but throughout the 20th century, they were unafraid to explore into really um, non-traditional non markets for them. They explored into healthcare. They got into capital markets and finance. They even got into media. But they haven't stopped there. As they're looking at the challenges that are facing them in the 21st century, they're embracing new ideas and actually new routes to market through things like crowdsourcing. So their eco-imagination platform, they're actually calling people to participate to help them find more environmentally friendly products. And they're tapping into things like native innovation for their healthcare products because they know that they don't know what all the challenges are for the regional markets that they're trying to address. I think by embracing true innovation like this, they'll have a long and healthy future into the 21st century. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of all of this coming together. This is a copy, a, a picture from my Facebook page. Um, I'm clearly the target demographic. I never click on the Facebook ads. I completely ignore them. I don't play any of the Facebook games. But about a year ago, this thing popped up on the side of my Facebook page and I clicked on it. Uh, and this is what I found. It's a waterworks program and here's how it works. I was asked once I clicked on that link if I wanted to sponsor a water worker in India a dollar a day, 10 cents a day, whatever it was. The payment system was built right into the platform. It was super easy to use. So I'm sponsoring this water, water worker in India. Now she has an income and can support her family, but she's also getting training and access to clean water filters. In turn, what she does is she goes out into remote regions and does water education for the communities out there, explaining to them that actually waterborne diseases is one of the leading killers of children under five globally. Um, but she also not just gives them the training about hygiene and clean water, but gives them access to the clean water filters, radically transforming their lives. So she has a revenue and feels good, has meaningful work. These communities are transformed. I get a badge of honor on my Facebook page that demonstrates to the global community that I'm a concerned, compassionate citizen. Um, and Unilever and Facebook get the goodwill and license to operate. Here's how they did it. It was kicked off by the Unilever Foundation in conjunction with a nonprofit called PSI. Uh, they worked with a social enterprise called Beta Pond, which actually created the application that we're all using. They built that on top of the Facebook platform, and they're tapping in actually to two communities, the Facebook communities and the native communities in, in India. And they, they're bringing all of this together to create shared value in a system that they're calling Waterworks. But there's one missing piece here. It's not a replicable, profitable business model. It was done under the guise of the Unilever Foundation, and it's meaningful and important work, and we need more of this too. But what we really need is to be able to create these in a way that's generating profits so that businesses are more interested and, and excited about participating. The cost of externalities was not included in this, and this is a really big piece. Externalities are any part um, of the si ecosystem or the whole system that were not actually accounted for in the financial accounting. And there's positive and negative ones. So in this example, the positive one actually might be the productivity that um, that community s saw because they didn't have to walk a couple miles to get clean water or deal for hours a day with sick children. A negative externality would be the cost to society of corporations dumping and creating the dirty water in the first place. 
if we were able to include the cost of these externalities, and, and company, governments are starting to do this with things like social impact bonds, we can start to create profitable businesses that are also based on compassion. So we need governments at the table for this idea of collaborative innovation to work, and this is what it will look like. By bringing together all these different stakeholders, we can leverage the capacities and capabilities, tap into the collective wisdom of all of the different sectors where we're all working towards the same issue. It has to be focused on executing solutions. It has to be action-based, and also including uh, the generation of shared values so that everyone is winning at the end of the day. And by bringing all of these people together, you'll be distributing the risk and making it more likely for people to participate. Now, all of these people bring something to the table, and there's a reason that they should all be there, but I'm going to focus on the role of business today. Why do we need businesses to participate? Well, businesses largely have the biggest impact. Certainly, they have the largest capital. Um, a lot of the uh, companies have higher revenues than, com than countries do GDP. Um, but they also have the biggest impact. They're the largest consumers of natural resources. They employ the most people. So we need to ha have them at the table. But they also bring things that we need. Um, they bring the capital, the intellectual property, the human resources, uh, and probably most importantly, the brands and the global distribution systems that transcend national boundaries. But why would they want to participate? Well, they would want to participate because they want to be able to tap into the collective wisdom of all of these different shareholders who will bring something new to the table. We all know through work like Open Innovation that the, collective, the things that we can do collectively are much bigger and better than the things that we can do on our own. And finally, the first to market advantage. If they can sh share and distribute the risk, um, they can move into new areas like GE has done um, and be the company that's going to continue to serve into the 21st century. Once that magic happens in that room, the question is how do we get it to scale? And the only way that we get it to scale is by making sure that we're able to measure the solutions that we're trying to explore together. When we bring all of these different people into the room in an open and authentic way, the solutions that we come up with are better than any that we could have come up with on our own. But in order to reach scale, we need to demonstrate the profitability to the business world for them participating. So how do we, how do we get there? We only get there through action. We need action-based um, collaboration from all of the different stakeholders. And I'll just leave you with a couple of thoughts about what that would look like. It's important to understand your system. So if you're working within an organization, working within a company, to understand the DNA and the core capabilities of the system that you're working in, but also the areas of opportunity and the challenges that are facing you in the 21st century. From there, it's important to find natural partners. Now, I've personally found that a lot of this is based on personal relationships. But even if that's not true and you're trying to get into new areas, it needs to be built on trust and shared vision and shared goals. And once you identify those people and bring them all into the room, the focus needs to be on the creation of shared value. Everyone in the room, just like in the Unilever example, needs to be winning when they leave. And we need to be able to measure that winning and create compelling business cases so that we can replicate and scale that up much more quickly. I believe that through action and collaboration, we'll be able to leave a more prosperous and cleaner future for the next generation. Thank you.